I don't know about you, but housing seems pretty expensive to me right now. Sure, there are ups and downs, but since the early 80s, house prices have gone up more sharply than wages. And that means if you're struggling to pay rent, or maybe you're battling to get into the housing market, you're not alone. But it's not all doom and gloom. Some people are coming up with some pretty creative ways of getting into the market. Building cheaply, splitting costs with other people. So we're going to have a look at how they did it. Andrew Kerr is an architect. He's worked as a tour guide and he loves to travel. And a few years ago, he decided he'd like to build a house without giving up his travelling lifestyle. I didn't need or didn't want a large house. Um, just wanted something that was well designed, efficient. The aim was to build the house for less than $70,000. Yep, you heard me, $70,000. So how do you do that? Well, Andrew hired a local builder, but he did a lot of the unskilled work on site himself. And he also cut costs by using local timber from the site, using recycled bricks and getting seconds and offcuts for the roof. He roped in some family help with painting and most importantly, he was building a small house. I mean, every square metre costs money. Um, so if you can save um, building space that you don't need, um, that, that it saves money as well. Andrew made some design decisions that pushed up the building cost. In the end, Andrew spent $103,000 on the build and $30,000 on services. Add in the $75,000 he spent on the land a few years earlier, and the total cost of the home was less than $210,000. But I think something like this, this similar size or um, similar design would be appropriate for um, you know, many singles or couples. Um, and likewise could be used as an ancillary unit or a granny flat. Michael Fotheringham is kind of an expert when it comes to affordable housing. He reckons there are a few factors making housing less affordable than 30 years ago, including wages not keeping up with property prices, more housing being bought up by mum and dad investors, and other cost of living increases such as energy and transport. Governments are, are doing what they can at, at federal and state level and increasingly at local government level. But at the same time, we're seeing really creative approaches from individuals responding to a, a challenging system. It turns out there are a few people building houses on the cheap. After her relationship ended, Emma Honan realised she was going to have to rent out her house to cover the mortgage. So, she set herself what seems like a kind of impossible task, build a second home on her property for herself and her two children for $100,000 in just 12 weeks. So I drew up the house plans and, and, and then had them drafted up for the builder. Emma kept her costs low by doing her own simple design and project management, doing a lot of unskilled labour herself enlisting some help from friends and using mostly second-hand materials. There was a house um, that was being demolished just in the next suburb and there was an ad in the paper saying that all the materials from that house were available for $3,000. That was a bargain price for $15,000 worth of floorboards, weatherboards and windows. So they just got delivered here and then we just spent weeks and weeks um, preparing them, denailing them, stripping the paint off, getting them ready for the carpenters and um, to use. So, what was the total cost? $100,000, including fees and approvals. And the total time? 12 weeks. And Emma thinks anyone can do it, as long as the design is simple and a lot of the materials are recycled. I mean, I made a few a few things, a few mistakes that I would do differently, but not many. Um, overall, I'm, yeah, I'm really happy. It's a great space. But what if you can't afford to buy or can't afford to build by yourself? Well, not everyone's going it alone. Stop, stop, stop. 
sisters Lynn Sugden and Julie Newby have joined forces to find a nice place they can retire to without the big bill. We bought a block um, which had two old cottages on it and that's how it all started. The sisters are cutting costs by building a duplex, expanding on the existing cottages. It's saving the sisters money because it's a single dwelling and Julie and Lynn are sharing rates, sharing bins, sharing bills and getting Julie's son to build the homes. If we're having an argument about where, who's going to plant what plant in our garden out the back, we'll, we have our own separate um, parts to go to. So We don't argue uh, that much. We, yeah, we get on pretty well. Whoever out there wants to do this, I think that they should just get together, mm. work it out and just go for it. Sometimes it's the cost of land that is the biggest hurdle to affordable housing. So what if you could buy the house and not have to pay for the expensive land underneath? St Clements in Mile End is London's first community land trust site helping 23 local families stay in a part of town that's getting more and more expensive. Naya Yakumaki and her partner moved to East London when it wasn't so trendy. But 17 years down the track, they needed a bigger home and they found they'd been priced out. So we were stuck, completely stuck in a small two bedroom, growing family, yeah, the needs were not met and we couldn't move. It was impossible for us to move. Naya came across a community land trust being proposed in their area, St Clements. Community land trusts, or CLTs, have been pretty successful in the US. People buy the house rather than the land. That's owned by a cooperative or not-for-profit, which is usually lobbied a council or another authority for it. So the CLT home, as a principle, is built on free land. But this immediately removes a huge amount of the cost to a buyer because you don't pay for the land. The St Clement's home prices are tied to the area's average income, which makes them about a third of the local market value. CLT homes are about creating affordable living, not investment opportunities, because when owners decide to sell, they need to apply the same pricing formula. We very much know and we have accepted and we have endorsed that when we sell our CLT home, we won't make any money. So could community land trusts work in Australia? Well, technically, yes. And there's been some pretty extensive research done. Dr Louise Crabtree has helped write the manual, literally. Looking at um, some of the legal considerations and how organisations that are here um, can go about uh, setting up community land trusts and uh, articulating that relationship between the organisation and the resident. It's tricky in Australia to separate land and buildings and there are no community land trust housing projects here yet. But Louise Crabtree thinks that will soon change with similar models focused on permanent affordability. We are seeing um, an uptake uh, or an uptick in interest here in Australia, um, I think because of those challenges that I mentioned before around uh, the ongoing problems with housing costs and people's uh, concerns with building quality. Not everyone wants to own a home, but even the cost of renting has gone up over the past couple of decades. But there are some innovative solutions being tried by people who are willing to think outside the box. Murundaka Co-Housing is a housing cooperative. Kate Grant has lived there for about eight years for both social and financial reasons. I'd been quite uh, low income and it was a way of getting out of the private rental market with all the uncertainties and insecurities of that. Co-ops are popular in North America as an alternative to private rentals. The tenants are members or shareholders in the organisation that owns the property. And we are the treasurers 
and the, the, the landlords as well as the tenants here. So all the members are responsible for running the whole co-op collecting the rent. For Kate and the other tenants, the co-op model means their rent is based on income. Tenants are on a 99-year lease and anyone who gets behind in their rent can work out a payment plan. What it means in simple terms is when your income goes up, so does your rent. When your income goes down, so does your rent. There's a minimum and a maximum so that people know what they're in for. Murrindaka tenants have their own units, but they're expected to share their time, prepping shared meals and doing maintenance. Rachel Lowe enjoys the lack of financial stress, as well as the sense of community. But co-ops aren't for everyone. It takes people who have patience, but a sense of humour, and beyond a sense of humour, compassion. In the US, some young people aren't paying any rent. Almost 10 years ago, a student housing shortage in Cleveland prompted a novel idea. Judson Retirement Community opened its doors to college students. Nina Keegan is one of three music students living there for free, in exchange for performing recitals a few times a year. For Nina, the benefits are clear. She's getting free rent, a huge space to herself, and plenty of room to practice. So in my old place, I was living with two other musicians, and we got quite a few complaints that year. We got a lot of angry letters about our practicing being too loud. Nina thinks it's a win-win, with residents getting to enjoy music and friendship with the younger generation. It is a big commitment on both sides, but I think it's totally worth it. Um, I can't imagine living anywhere else after this. So when it comes to affordable housing, yes, governments and industry make a lot of the big decisions. But as you can see, at least some creative individuals are successfully cutting costs. I mean, their ideas might not be for everyone, but it's something to think about.